Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the media. Berhaba. I thank the uh, government of Turkey uh, for hosting this important meeting of the G20. Let me start by reiterating my profound condolences to the people of France following the barbaric terrorist attacks in Paris on Friday night. My thoughts are with the families of the victims at this time of grief and loss. Terrorists continue to commit atrocious acts across the world. Their inhumanity is clear. Their ideologies are bankrupt. No grievance or cause can justify such violence. Those who claim to be acting in the name of religion are only harming their religion. Terrorism is a threat to all humankind. As we have seen over the years with a grim regularity, no country and no city, nobody is immune. In the past four days alone, horrendous terrorist bombings have also killed dozens of people in Beirut and Baghdad. It is heartbreaking to see so many families, communities, and societies hardened or left in ruins. It is tragic to see so many people, largely young men, so radicalized that they are willing to lose their lives in spasm of meaningless violence. We will be discussing terrorism at this summit. I will stress to world leaders that our response needs to be robust, but always within the rule of law and with respect for human rights. Otherwise, we will only fan the fire we are trying to put out. We also need to address the underlying drivers of violent extremism. I will soon present to the members, member states of the United Nations a comprehensive plan of action to prevent violent extremism. At this time of heightened tension, I caution against the action that would only perpetuate the cycle of hatred and violence. I again offer condolences to the families and loved ones of the victims and to all the people of France. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this summit uh, takes place as we approach the end of what has been a watershed year uh, for international cooperation. Governments have agreed a new and visionary sustainable development agenda with the 17 sustainable development goals to the year 2030. These goals can set an environmentally sustainable world. They should be a priority for this summit. Governments will soon meet in Paris to finalize a global climate change agreement. 161 countries representing more than 90% of global greenhouse gas emissions have now submitted their intended nationally determined contributions, or INDCs. These plans uh, will bend the emissions, emissions curve downward and move us in the right uh, direction. But they will not keep us under the dangerous uh, two degrees Celsius uh, threshold. Uh, we have to go much further and faster. I see four essential elements for success in Paris. First, durability. Paris must send a clear signal to markets that the low carbon transformation of the global economy is inevitable and beneficial, and it is already going fast. Second, flexibility. The agreement must be able to accommodate changes in the global economy while striking balance between the leadership role of developed countries and the increasing responsibilities of developing countries. Third, solidarity. 
An agreement must provide the financial and technological technology transform for developing countries. Developed countries must keep their pledge to provide $100 billion a year by 2020 for both adaptation and mitigation. And fourth, credibility. An agreement must establish strong monitoring mechanisms, be able to respond to rapidly escalating climate impacts, and ensure that we are on a path to a low carbon economy as science demands. With the two weeks left before the start of COP21, it is urgent that all leaders work to find a compromise. I also count on G20 leaders for support as we address the biggest crisis of forced displacement since the Second World War. This is not only a crisis of numbers, it is a crisis of global solidarity. I pay tribute to Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon for hosting over 4 million Syrian refugees. We must ensure enhanced support to these and other countries accommodating the greatest numbers of refugees. Without, at the same time, from cutting back on official development assistance, I strongly appeal to European countries coping with mass forced displacement not to reduce development assistance to finance the cost of refugee flows. Helping people in need should not be a zero-sum game. I urge G20 leaders to heed the growing global call for a recovery plan for the region, perhaps akin to the Marshall Plan in scale. We should also work together towards a much-needed global compact for human mobility. I will soon present to the General Assembly further thoughts and ideas on this matter. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, reaching a political settlement in Syria should be a top priority. I welcome the renewed sense of urgency that the International Syria Support Group is bringing to this effort. And I commend the leadership of US Secretary of State John Kerry and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and others involved in the talks yesterday in Vienna. I urge the participants to move beyond their differences so that they can push for a nationwide ceasefire combat terrorism, and address key governance and constitutional issues. After years of division, this is a rare moment of diplomatic opportunity to end the violence and advance the search for a negotiated political solution. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Tatiana Kolmakova, Russian news agency, Ria Novosti. Um, Secretary General, um, do you think that um, has the position of international society uh, changed because of the terrorist attacks in Paris? And do you think that now the understandings of uh, establishing really common operation in Syria is growing? And uh, the last question, could you tell us something about this uh, statement on terrorism uh, that will be presented by uh, G20 leaders? Thank you very much. Terrorist acts uh, have been there since a long time, but not as rampant and often and brutal in its scale as we are now seeing. And that is very worrisome, and that's uh, really uh, alarming. So that is why the, I sincerely hope that uh, particularly G20 leaders who possess all capacity and political will and resources uh, discuss this matter. Uh, this is a right time, very opportune timing 
for, for them to address this issue collectively. There have been many such efforts and commitments, but we need much more coordinated and concerted effort at this time. Uh, we have seen so many, so often, uh, such um, large-scale terrorist attacks. Those are just innocent uh, citizens without knowing what will happen to their lives. So it's uh, totally unacceptable. Whatever grievances, whatever political or religious reasons there may be, those are not acceptable. That we have to take uh, strong actions in the name of humanity. That is why, as I uh, briefed in my earlier remarks, then I, we are working very hard to present the comprehensive plan of action uh, to combating extremism, violent extremism and terrorism to the General Assembly of the United Nations. And I sincerely hope that uh, leaders will be united this time. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mehmet Poyrazlı. I am working for Economic Development Foundation and also the representative of Civil Society 20 in Turkey. Uh, one of our recommendations, uh, giving the opportunity to civil society to contribute to G20 process by providing a permanent seat uh, at the G20, especially development working groups. Uh, what do you think about the civil society role uh, in good governance and uh, contributing to G20? Thank you. My experience and observation, as well as lessons uh, which I have learned as a Secretary General of the United Nations during the last uh, nine years, is that uh, in this uh, interconnected world where we experience a transformation, tra dramatic transformation in <clears throat> governance, uh, transportation, communications, we need, uh, we need the strong support and engagement of um, our civil society. Uh, I have been often saying that uh, when leaders establish a good a vision or policies, uh, we need to work in close partnership with business communities, private sectors, and civil society. When we have a tripartite partnership among governments, in my case, United Nations, business communities, and civil society, that, that's what I have been doing. Whether civil society should be a part of this G20 format, that uh, I do not have any uh, comment at this time. But it's important that the leaders, when they make a decision or agreement by among the G20 leaders, then they should closely work together with the business communities. Uh, often we have seen uh, on the margins of a G20 or G7 or G8, uh, business communities have been meeting, they have been holding their own, like a B20, like business 20, or L20, labor unions 20. I have seen many such uh, uh, events, side events of uh, civil societies. So I would strongly encourage civil society to take uh, active uh, participation and engagement, even though it may not be exact uh, G20 political leaders forum. Uh, that is what uh, we also expect that when we have a climate change summit meeting in Paris, I understand that at least 30,000 civil society uh, leaders will participate. And we listen very sincerely, very sincerely, to the voices and aspirations of a civil society. And they have been reflected. For example, when the leaders adopted the very visionary, far-reaching, the sustainable development agenda aiming 2030, I made it quite clear that we must listen and combine all, reflect the voices and aspirations of civil society. Then indeed, they were invited by the General Assembly and they expressed their views to the General Assembly. And I have been reaching out at least eight million people, 
8 million people to, to reflect their voices. The Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals, are the results of your voices and the business community's voices. So this will, we will continue to do that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your, your speech. Um, we've seen that ISIL has adopted a pretty robust media strategy. Um, they seem to have, uh, you know, carry out terrorist attacks that also get as much uh, media coverage as possible. What role do you see the media as playing in supporting um, international forums, G20, UN, OECD, and the like, and also while maintaining freedom of speech, um, and not providing as much coverage to these terrorist atrocities or, or supporting that strategy that, as, that ISIL has adopted? In the past, um, terrorists were acting secretly. Uh, secretly. Uh, we didn't know much where they were hiding, from where they were coming out. But the difference of this uh, ISIL, Daesh, that they have um, very active uh, communication strategy. They have some land space. They have their own sources of uh, finance. These are very alarming. That is why I have been asking and urging world leaders who have uh, those capacity to be united. That is what the coalition uh, forces are now uh, taking action now. But since the way they behave, they operate, is very well calibrated, then they should be much, much coordinated and co in concerted efforts by the international community. You heard what uh, world leaders like uh, President Hollande or President Obama and other leaders have been uh, speaking out their positions. That is why United Nations is now actively engaging in combining all the experiences of the countries who have been affected by this uh, terrorist attack so that we will have a much more comprehensive, broader strategy by the United Nations as you may remember, in 2006, the General Assembly of the United Nations has adopted United Nations Global Counterterrorism Strategy. Under this, we have established Counterterrorism Center. Uh, but at this time, after almost 10 years, and having experienced such a massive, um, all the different type of uh, brutal, brutal um, uh, terrorist attacks, we have to think differently. That is why I have been, we have been contacting many countries in the world. Uh, first of all, try to strengthen the individual countries' capacity, uh, how we can bring uh, their capacity up to the standard, and how we can have some uh, <coughs> consulted efforts by the international community. That's what I'm going to present. Uh, to the General Assembly soon, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emre Peker with the Wall Street Journal. Sir, um, the um, Turkish President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has criticized the UN and especially the Security Council on numerous occasions and saying uh, it's the world events are at the behest of only five nations. Uh, how can, uh, because of the veto process um, and blocking um, a solution in Syria, what can the UN do uh, to help uh, bring about <clears throat> a political solution to the conflict in Syria and how uh, Ty, do you see uh, ISIS terrorism uh, with, this, with the conflict in Syria, and do the two need to be addressed together or separately? Thank you. 
Uh, your question com is, comprises uh, two um, questions, but in a sense related. Uh, when it comes to how to change or uh, expect the Security Council work in a more concerted, uh, united way, the member states have been discussing and negotiating this issue over 20 years, 20 years, uh, they all, it seems to me that there is um, almost unanimous views that the Security Council uh, should be reformed in a more democratic, more transparent, uh, more accountable, or more representative way. Uh, for that point, I think there is no uh, uh, different views. And how to change the Security Council's uh, code of, uh, method of work, including veto powers, uh, that uh, you will find a uh, <coughs> number of uh, different, different uh, views uh, depending upon uh, <coughs> the countries. Uh, the Security Council agenda has, uh, reform agenda has been now getting a lot of uh, uh, attention and member states have been actively engaging in uh, negotiations. So we are now uh, uh, expecting they will make some uh, uh, accelerations. On this, because of this kind of uh, some division, <coughs> division and not united way, uh, it has affected uh, seriously uh, to the resolution of a security, I mean Syrian, a Syrian situation. Uh, now I am uh, very much encouraged that the five permanent members of the Security Council and other uh, major actors uh, in the region, including uh, Turkey and Sy Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, they have been sitting together for a second time in Vienna. I think they made a good uh, agreement which we need to see um, <clears throat> implemented as soon as possible. Uh, the forming a transitional government within six months, transition in six months, and also uh, uh, having election in six, 18 months, that means about two years a period. I think that is quite uh, uh, ambitious and encouraging uh, agreement. To do this possible, there should be a nationwide ceasefire. Uh, my special envoy, uh, Stefan Demistra, uh, has been and will continue to work uh, very closely with uh, concerned parties to first of all establish nationwide ceasefire all throughout uh, Syria. Then move on forming this uh, transition, uh, transition body in accordance with the Geneva communique of uh, June uh, 2012. It may be a bit uh, ambitious uh, time frame, but there is nothing which we cannot do when we are united. I've been urging the members of the Security Council, particularly five permanent members, that they should solidarity and flexibility, as have they, they have done in the case of uh, dealing with uh, Iranian nuclear issues. That was quite the encouraging uh, development, and sh they have shown solidarity. Now they are now beginning to show solidarity uh, over these uh, Syrian issues, and uh, I'm, United Nations has been mandated uh, by this 20-country uh, uh, group uh, decision uh, to promote, uh, first of all, this uh, dialogue and transition and this election should be monitored uh, by the United Nations. We will do our uh, best efforts. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Thank, you. Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you.